Ambassador Amar Sina, 19th of August, 100 years of independence for Afghanistan. That should have been the focus. Two days before that, one of the worst massacres in Afghanistan's history, if not this year, in the long term as well. There have been attacks continuing, peace talks have uh, gone through eight rounds, possibly another, maybe a deal coming through. But even if some kind of peace deal is being reached or an initial framework, it doesn't seem that the bloodletting is ending. Well, thank you, Amitabh. Let me, I know it's a, it's a sad moment. Uh, the celebrations in Afghanistan have been postponed. But still, it's a historic day. It is really, it marks 100 years of uh, Afghanistan declaring independence or victory over Britain after the third Anglo-Afghan war in 1919. Uh, and what it did really was it gave uh, full control of the, of the state uh, to the Afghan government. As you know, after the second uh, Anglo-Afghan war in 1978-80, uh, a protectorate status of British had been imposed on the Afghan government and it took them, uh, what, 39 years to unshackle themselves. So while, of course, the moment is sad, I still take hope from the history. Uh, even the current stage of Afghanistan uh, turmoil has nearly gone on for 29 years, 30 years. So perhaps we will see some light at the end of the tunnel and Afghan nation will stand proud again. And if you just for a moment, look at that independence, 100 years of that. In South Asia, Afghanistan has been independent from colonial rule the longest. Well, the formation, if you look at the <laughs> nation state, came over 100 years sure. before us, before India and Pakistan came into bearing, uh, being in 1947. Uh, it was established in 1847, actually, in Kandahar. So it has a long history, a long tradition of being a nation state. Uh, so that is why you can see that though they are wounded, uh, it has been a bloody 100 years, uh, perhaps, in many ways. But it's still the sense of nationhood and the pride uh, is very much there. Uh, so as uh, somebody said, that they are just perhaps uh, down but not out. In fact, um, Saeed Mohsaini quoted from the Invictus poem when he said yes. that uh, they may be bloody but not bowed. But the attack on that wedding, the Shia wedding, mm, just two days before independence, absolutely Horrendous. No, absolutely. And it's adding a new sort of layer of violence, as you see. Uh, it is becoming sectarian. Uh, it is hitting at the unity of Afghan nation. Attempting uh, no. to. Oh, absolutely. It is attempting to. Uh, and of course, uh, I have always held, and there are many in Afghanistan who believe, that these claims by ISIS are also claims of great opportunity. Whenever uh, other well-known groups, uh, which have uh, well-identified supporters, uh, don't want to take claim because uh, of the outrage, uh, the ISIS spokesman comes up and takes. But who is this ISIS? We have to really ask and people have to start inquiring. No, the first I ISPK, I was there in Afghanistan when it came up. Uh, there was a, a disgruntled leader, his name was Hafiz Saeed, who was there. He lasted a few months, then his deputy uh, was also killed in a drone. They were all Pakistanis. Uh, now, in fact, the identity of the attacker has been uh, issued by ISIS. That also seems to be a Pakistani. From the Orakzai. Absolutely. The ISPK today currently is also head, headed by a Pakistani. He is also close connection. On, actually, he's an ex lashkar e taiba mm -hmm. So, a close connection of uh, even perhaps the deep state in Pakistan. He's, a, he's also known as Malvi Abdullah, known to be close to the Haqqani group, which is also seen as very ruthless. All these different names, are they... Are there some form of, like you were pointing out earlier, a deniability for whoever doesn't want yes, to be associated with it? Yes, it creates confusion and it, it provides deniability. It is absolutely clear. Uh, with the Haqqani is deeply embedded in the Taliban today, uh, which was, I think, uh, a very uh, smart move to do because they also would get whitewashed along with Taliban. Uh, this distinction that we tend to make among uh, different terror groups uh, when it comes to Afghanistan, I think, is no longer very valid uh, because all these organizations, which is uh, lashkar e taiba and we know that our interests were attacked by lashkar e taiba etc., but they used Haqqani assets. And similarly, uh, so Taliban today can't really say that they are completely sort of uh, separate from ISIS and there are no overlaps. 
Uh, in fact, uh, I would think that if this peace deal goes through, a lot of foot soldiers perhaps may take up a different flag and start fighting under IS uh, PK uh, banner. Is that the purpose of uh, the Pakistani deep state? Uh, we've talked about it even in earlier interviews and so many experts have weighed in on it. That it's the insurance plan, it's plan B in case a group of the Taliban or the Taliban strike some kind of deal with the US. See, that is how it started. Let's be, be fair that it started like that. And these were all disgruntled elements from Tariq Taliban Pakistan. These were all, as I had uh, previously also mentioned, all people drawn from Morakzai tribe. NDS had uh, evidence to suggest that some of them could have been regular also because they had found documentation on their uh, bodies when they started in Achin in Nangarhar. But then what has happened? Once you form a core like this, it becomes a magnet. And obviously a lot of these uh, elements of free radical elements who are looking for a cause have gravitated towards it. Uh, and also I noticed that all the externally focused groups, mm. whether it was ATIM or IMU and others, they have all perhaps under ultimatum been asked to leave FATA when Zarbe Azbis happened and they have all gravitated towards this flag. Now is that uh, just a change of heart? Is it coincidental? I don't believe so. Obviously, uh, some elements sort of put them all together uh, under one uh, uh, sort of flag. When you're talking about a uh, possible intermediate initial framework uh, deal that is possibly going to be reached between the US and the Taliban initially and then possibly the Afghans themselves will be involved. Uh, the comments that have come out from both President Trump and uh, from Ambassador Zalmay Khalidzad post this horrendous, horrific attack, which some are calling a war crime, genocide even, uh, seems to suggest uh, that the Americans, like we all knew for a while, are only interested in getting out and then letting the Afghans sort it out, if I can use that euphemism themselves. Well, I think that is becoming increasingly clear. Uh, that while, of course, I can understand the fatigue that has set in in, in some areas of uh, American policymaking circles, uh, I don't think this is a view which is shared by all Americans. Let's be clear on that. Uh, at least if you look at the US Army, they seem to have a different view of things. Maybe the differences are not sharply articulated in public, but I think in many statements that you see, whether to the Congress or Senate, it comes across very clearly. Uh, and this is not the first time it has happened. As you know, when uh, President Obama was doing his review, then also I think the military had weighed in and he had eventually uh, sort of come around to that view and that's when he had the surge and the withdrawal announced uh, together. Having said that, even in the current peace agreement that you see, it has four elements. The first two elements are the ones which have been negotiated in these last eight rounds and these two really concern the Americans. So it is uh, the American withdrawal schedule, uh, which is uh, Taliban is insisting and America is uh, providing. Uh, and of course, second is the guarantees that Taliban will give that territories under their control uh, will not be used against America or its interests. Uh, I, of course, there I see that the, uh, the focus has narrowed substantially and Taliban also has diluted. It doesn't say that uh, they will not allow Afghan territory to be used uh, for uh, attacks on America. They say territories under their control, uh, which of course leads a lot of questions uh, for, for any negotiator. Once these two elements are in place, and of course after the eighth round, which finished on what, uh, eighth, late night, ninth, early morning, uh, the message that we got was uh, first from Taliban sources, unnamed sources, that there was no deal. But there was also a message that each one is now referring it to their leadership. We have seen that over this weekend, uh, that means last Sunday, this is what, uh, 18th, 19th, uh, President Trump did take a review meeting and they have looked at uh, various elements. But of course, on the Taliban side, it's not clear where the leadership resides. Are they referring to the Quetta leadership uh, or is it the Rawalpindi leadership that has been re referred to? Uh, perhaps it could be Quetta if you look at what happened on seven, uh, on 15th, the, the mosque. Kuchlak mosque attack, which is the mosque which was presided by, uh, by the current Emir, Habaitullah, uh, till he became the Taliban's Emir. He was expected to be there. Uh, he leads the prayer when he is there. And so the bomb was put under the uh, preacher's table. 
Uh, but there are reports that his younger brother, who was uh, leading and who is heading that uh, mosque, which left mosque now, uh, has got killed. So obviously attempts are being made at every level to completely derail the peace talks because obviously there is a feeling that both among the Taliban and Americans that they are very close. Mm -hmm. So there could be powers which don't want it uh, to move so quickly. Uh, first attempt, of course, as uh, you saw, was by the Pakistani foreign minister when he tried to link uh, India's action in Kashmir to Taliban talks. Mm -hmm. And he very openly said that the talks will suffer, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, not only the Afghan government has rejected very uh, soundly, but even the Taliban on 7th of August, if you saw their statement, uh, rejected any such linkage. After that, we see that there was an attack on the Taliban leadership itself, a very direct attack. And this would have been the second time that the Taliban leader, which perhaps did not toe the line, was getting disposed of uh, in, uh, in a violent manner. And third, of course, this uh, attack that you see in Kabul, what you said, to bring in a new element of, of dividing the Afghan nation and attempt to divide the Afghan nation by a really brutal and a completely senseless attack on a wedding ceremony of somebody who was not even with the government or not associated with the government. But perhaps his only uh, thought was that he belonged to a different denomination in Islam. So coming back to your question, yeah. now whether ISIS and Taliban will fight each other? Well, perhaps at one level when it comes to controlling territory, controlling the, uh, the bounty of the war, let us put it this way, uh, yes, they may fight and they have been fighting even today. But at certain ideological level, there will be a lot of similarities. And this anti-sectarianism would be an important one. The fear is that I hope these elements don't combine to attack more Shia interests and take the foolish step of stepping beyond Afghanistan and turn their gaze towards Iran. And that will be a disaster for Afghanistan as a nation. But I'm very hopeful that the, the leadership in Afghanistan, and there is a very sizable amount of uh, Afghans who don't accept Taliban in its current form. Uh, they are willing to live with them uh, and co-share power. But surely they don't want a Taliban-controlled uh, government or live in a regime that sort of ra ran a state, which we all saw between 1996 and 2001. So what do you read into Ambassador Khalilzad's tweets when he says it's more important now after the attack that uh, we should reach some kind of a peace agreement uh, because then the Afghans can fight against ISIS. So I ISKP or Daesh, whatever you want to call them. No, I, I respect his views. You see, you do need a small, uh, strong state and, and an empowered Afghan national security forces to fight all such terror organizations. Uh, now, whether this will be a factor leading towards uh, sort of greater and quicker intra-Afghan talks, I'm not very sure. Mm. But the fact is that one thing where I differ, that this bringing back this idea of good terrorists and bad terrorists seems to be sort of uh, uh, coming back in fashion again. And with whom? After. With the Americans? And with, I mean, <laughs> yes, the Pakistanis course. always accused of doing that. But Yes. So, but I hope his assessment, because he has interacted closely with uh, Taliban, or at least the Quetta leadership of Taliban, um, I wish him well. And I, I really hope that the Quetta leadership retains control on its foot soldiers on the ground because ultimately they will be the one who will uh, determine the direction of the war. But yes, a uh, united Afghanistan, a uh, leadership that is united, uh, which is which stands behind its security forces, legitimate security forces, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is the right step uh, and we should all be supportive of that. But if you're saying it is a possibility and it is being seen as the lines blurring between the Taliban, the ISKP, other organizations there, Oh, how does India deal with the so-called Taliban that are dealing with the US who could come into power of some sort? See, the worst case scenario would be what? A peace deal, the way I think it will look like would be Taliban in some sort of a power sharing arrangement, mm -hmm. uh, maybe 50-50. A redo, a rejig of the national unity government that we saw here uh, would be the most likely outcome. Taliban perhaps will even agree to respect, at least to begin with, the framework of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. They may add emirates in between. I think some hints were given by 
Mutasim Agajan uh, when he spoke uh, after the last round that they are okay with Islamic Republic Emirates of Afghanistan and then some sort of formula. Uh, they could even think of some election process, but above this election process, they may look at some sort of a clerical council uh, which controls. So we don't know. These details have been kept very, very close uh, by the negotiators, both sides. Uh, so these are more in the realm of speculation, but these could be the likely outcomes that I see because replacing everything that is today there in Kabul, mm -hmm. I don't think that is feasible today and it will not be accepted by the Afghan people. Many Afghans are worried about the speculation that you're saying that there will be a overarching spiritual head or a spiritual body above any elected or government. But uh, how does India deal with the situation in the run-up to any kind of an initial and post? See, it is not the, the spiritual, spiritual body uh, which should worry us, basically, but it is the nature of that body which should, uh, if at all, should be a concern for us. But we should really look at the uh, the formal government structure that uh, emerges in Afghanistan, uh, whether uh, it, in, it is inclusive, whether it has all the people who are nationalists uh, there. And that is what we should support. We need to really work on two fronts. One is bringing all the nationalist Afghans together on a common platform. And I think that was a message that even Prime Minister sent out in his Independence Day speech uh, when he not only congratulated, but what he really meant was that we, uh, we, India has stood for a sovereign and united Afghanistan. And that is what the Prime Minister perhaps was hinting at the leadership, that this is a critical time as they celebrate 100 years of independence. They have to understand that it is only in their unity that they can preserve their independence. Uh, and yes, it is, it is, I think, a very critical juncture for Afghanistan. Uh, well, while on one hand they are celebrating 100 years of independence, on the other they really see that their future is getting battered and they may have a, a difficult situation and a decision on their hands. You, you mentioned the, the Prime Minister's speech there. Specifically though, how can India bring or unify uh, most of the forces because we are in Afghanistan political, uh, because we have goodwill across the board? Correct. And that is our strength. Uh, we have goodwill uh, both uh, among the political leadership uh, and also among the non-political Afghans. Very large segments of Afghan understand that India has been a neutral uh, power, uh, a very honest friend, uh, which has not meddled in their political choices, what they want to choose. And I guess this our neutrality and the fact that we have been a factor for good and stability is not lost on Taliban also. So I feel, of course, first we need to, uh, I think, actively engage at the highest political levels, uh, the Afghan leadership, cutting across uh, uh, parties and factions, bring them together, and perhaps also in future look at both reaching out to Taliban once they start the intra-Afghan dialogue and conveying the same message to Taliban. And we can also be a very neutral uh, venue uh, for these uh, intra-Afghan talks. Seen the Taliban go across the globe from Indonesia to Uzbekistan to China to Iran, why not uh, India as well? Uh, Shah Mahmood Qureshi and the Pakistan establishment apart, if there is some kind of a deal with the Taliban, is there any worry of jihadi elements being diverted if there's some kind of peace in, in Afghanistan and they're not being used there like they are currently, of them being diverted to, uh, to, Kash to Kashmir or to India? Well, two parts to your question, uh, Amitabh. First, the diplomatic acceptance. Yes, that is true that they are being treated, uh, I think, uh, as a quasi-government mm. or a government in exile by many governments. And the statements but, also, like you said, yes, the Kashmir absolutely. statement is yeah, absolutely prematurely very, looking at itself as a... <laughs> so, yes, I, I mentioned that in a tweet, <laughs> that they are taking their role as a government seriously, but it's uh, slightly premature. Uh, but Taliban also should realize, while it is, of course, uh, it's a great boost to their egos that they are getting received in so many uh, foreign offices. But they should not forget that this recognition is also an encouragement for them to change. It is not a carte blanche given by all these governments that they can actually go back to their policies of 1996 and 2001 and they hope to retain this goodwill and this diplomatic recognition. So I think they will be fooling themselves that if they think that all these governments have given them a blank check, uh, that they could go, go ahead and behave the way they do. 
Uh, and that is why perhaps there is also a time when, uh, though I have been an ardent supporter that we should not engage with Taliban, I feel that once the intra-Afghan dialogue begins, uh, we should also be reaching out to them and engaging them in some manner, uh, either directly or including through our friends uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and, the fear and the second is whether they will be fought here. In fact, uh, or whichever groups are there, or whatever you name them, if, if they are unemployed, if I can again euphemistically use that word, there, do they need to find another See, battleground? See, there is, there is always this possibility. Uh, of course, ideally, this even if Pakistan has rejected, um, though not officially, but there's a lot of writing where there, this uh, policy of strategic debt is sort of discredited, that they don't require it. I hope that is correct. But the fact that there are ungoverned spaces in Afghanistan, uh, there is a likelihood that such groups could uh, sort of get together and provide that basic infrastructure for anti-India terror groups to operate. But I would not be overtly worried about it right now. No matter who trains there, but you have to remember that eventually they will have to reach India by traversing Pakistan. So we have to get our Border uh, Security Act in place. Uh, and on a lighter vein, I must refer to your video, which I saw with the most brilliant uh, response. A similar question was asked to the young PTM, Pashtun Tahfuz movement oh, yes. leader. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, do you think once jihad is declared in Kashmir, uh, Pashtuns will go and fight there? He said, we've done enough. He Why said, yes, Punjabi brothers go we and have do taken a lot of, we have done a lot of jihad. And we would leave it for the uh, Punjabi brothers also to gain some sort of uh, both experience and, and indulge in jihad and get the blessings of Allah. Uh, so I think that was a brilliant answer. Uh, and of course, he also said that Pakistan also has a full-fledged military. Correct. Uh, <laughs> so rather than using civilians, mm -hmm. uh, they could perhaps uh, use their uh, military. But yes, the, the fear is there. Uh, I don't know whether the Afghans, if they're told that they're to go and fight in India, there'll be too many willing mm -hmm. volunteers. But we have seen that foreign terrorist or personnel had been used in Kashmir before. And there is will be increased uh, concern on that account. Where does this leave the whole presidential poll process in Afghanistan? Well, actually, the messages on this is very, very conflicted. Mm -hmm. Let's put it this way. The opinion is divided. Uh, obviously, uh, if the talks don't conclude by September 1, as the Americans have given a timeline, uh, going ahead with the polls would be seen as a rebuff to the peace talks. Now, whether that will happen as of now, I know that the uh, position of President Ghani, Dr. Abdullah and some others who are very keen that the election should happen. E European Union has come out strongly in favor of uh, elections, but they have not talked that it should happen only in 28th of September. Uh, we also, our position on elections are very clear that that is we feel that in a democracy or in any setup, that is the only way of choosing the next leadership where people participate. Uh, now. The difficulty with going ahead with the 28th September deadline is after this Taliban's open threat that they would kill people, unlike in 2014 when they actually uh, sort of allowed the elections to happen. If the turnout is very low, then there will always be a lingering question on the legitimacy of the next government. So this is a call that the Afghan government will have to take, mm. uh, that it's not only the process, but that the process has to be uh, sort of legitimate and have a legitimate outcome uh, to have that sort of clout to negotiate with Taliban. Uh, a haphazard disputed election would leave the Kabul government in a weaker position to negotiate. Ambassador Amarsana, again, as always, it's been a pleasure and I'd like to invoke those two lines from the Invictus poem again, 100 years of Afghan independence and we hope many more hundreds of possibly being bloodied but with the heads still not bowed. I am absolutely definite that we will see another 100 years of Afghanistan. Many countries which are trying to harm Afghanistan have to really worry whether they will survive the next 100 years in the form that they are today. Or even their first 100. Oh, absolutely. They have to still 28 years to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thank Thanks. you.